Dr. Shashi Tharoor, Honorable Minister of State for Human Resource Development, Mrs. Naina Lal Kidwai, Dr. T. Ramaswamy, Dr. Virendra Raj Dutt, Dr. Makanan Fadke, Mr. Shailend Porwal, of course, Dr. Didar Singh. Distinguished uh, participants in this global R&D summit and friends. It's a great pleasure to be here and I've been thankful to Fiki for inviting me here. As we all know, science is getting more and more uh, internationalized. According to the National Science Foundation of the United States, one quarter of the articles in 2010 had authors from more than one country, up from 10% in uh, 1990. There are more and more mega projects like the Large Hadron Collider. You heard about the Higgs boson, the signature of the Higgs boson being seen in the experiments of the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva to the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which is coming up in Kadrash in France. In both these, Large Hadron Collider and ETA, India is a member. These are all facilities dealing with research and development, some basic, like the Large Hadron Collider, which is looking at the ultimate structure of matter. And ETA, of course, looks at uh, fusion energy. In the World Economic Forum in Davos, in 2008, where I had gone as a member of the faculty, the theme was collaborative innovation. So we have collaborative research, and we have uh, collaborative innovation. And uh, last week I was in the US, the theme of the Indian Institute of Science Alumni Association meet was uh, building collaborations. And they are looking at India. They are looking at India as a collaborating partner, because India has a large s and infrastructure, number of departments. And industry is also beginning to expand. I remember last year inaugurating the Aditya Birla Science Center in near Bombay, which is of that with the Birla group. So industry is beginning to realize that it's not enough just to get technology transfer for what one would call proven products, proven technologies. Because as I often say, proven technologies are often a synonym for obsolete technology. If you want to be at the cutting edge, you have to participate in the generation of knowledge. See, the way science is done is changing. When Sri Raman discovered his uh, Nobel Prize winning Raman effect, of course he was the greatest experimental physicist India has produced. He was just one man with a few students. And this kind of research uh, continues. But to look for the Higgs boson, they had to build an accelerator, which is a large hadron collider, 100 meters below the ground. 26 kilometers in circumference, where you have got protons moving in opposite directions at four tera electron volts and occasionally colliding with one another. And when they collide, energy disappears and mass is produced. You have to read your MC squared upside down. Mass goes, you get energy, nuclear energy. When energy goes, you get mass. This is how they do high energy experimental physics. And uh, this is only one such experimental facility in the whole world where all countries, including India, are participating, participating in kind. And then look at the way Venki Ramakrishnan. Venki Ramakrishnan got the Nobel Prize in chemistry. He, he did his undergraduate work in Baroda, did his PhD in Ohio, went to California, switched from physics to biology. Then he went to United Kingdom, and that is where he did his 
Nobel Prize winning work and among his four students probably there was only one Briton. But on the record, the Nobel Prize is counted against the United Kingdom. This is how the uh, science is getting more and more, more and more uh, internationalized. And much of these basic research, I'm now at the moment I'm talking of basic research, it requires mega science facilities. And this kind of facilities cannot be built by pure scientists, it has to be built by engineers. In fact, large multidisciplinary engineering teams. India contributed 40, 40 million dollars worth of equipment for this machine. A thousand superconducting sextupole magnets, decapole magnets, which are placed all around the ring. And they have been put there not because they love Indians, of course they love Indians, but because this was the best equipment that they got, designed by the Raja Ramana Center, but produced by Indian industry. So we have to realize that Indian industry today has the capability to produce highly precision engineered equipment. And at that time when I signed the agreement, I signed the agreement in 1996, my colleagues told me, of course this 40 million dollars is estimated at European costs. Whatever they can build, we can build at half the cost. And of the same quality. And this actually happened. And as I said, uh, apart from the, the, this, uh, there are two detectors, what is called CMS and Alice, compact muon solenoid. CMS, one of the detectors in which Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, there is a consortium of universities with TFR as the leader, which is participating in this experiment. And when the data comes from the machine, from this detector, that data comes live to TIFR, because the two of us, India and the European Union, are now electronically connected. I'll come back to this briefly later. Coming to, ad coming to applied research, applied research, if you take this chain, research, development, delivery. Research, development, delivery. Very interesting article by a guy called Kenan Sahin in MIT Review in 2004. What he said was, universities are by and large very good in research, but they are poor in development, and generally zero in delivery, generally. Of course, there are exceptions. Industry is very good in delivery, it's poor in development, and by and large, zero in research. Of course, you may say Bell Labs and all that, you can also find uh, examples here, but by and large. So, and this article, title of this article by Kenan Sahin was Innovation Backlog. Innovation Backlog. See, research is generating new knowledge. Innovation, in this context, is adding economic value, strategic value, or societal benefit to knowledge. Even knowledge generated by by other people. So he's talking with the United States and saying there is a huge innovation backlog because these two systems are not connecting. And that is why it is very important to enhance academy industry interaction. Apart from whatever uh, in-house R&D that uh, industry can do, and one of the main things in my office is to enhance this academy and industry interaction for what we call pre-competitive applied research. Pre-competitive. If you want to do improve a proprietary product, it's the business of the industry. But if there are generic problems in any industry, then it becomes part of uh, part of the government's job. Like in automotive, we created uh, such structures for automotive research which was called CAR. We had representatives from both uh, academia and industry. See, alternate fuels, combustion research, lightweight alloys, hydroforming, all that becomes part of pre-competitive applied research, and then the government can, uh, government can support it. Then we have 
other things, but most importantly now, this is one thing we have slipped behind, electronics hardware, and uh, this structure, Karel, as it is called, uh, we are building it up. Now, India is also internationally participating in many things. For example, the Department of Space, not many people know that ISRO has launched 35 satellites from 19 countries using their Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle. They also collaborate with France to launch their GSLV from Guyana. And some of these important satellites that you see, the Megatropique, between the French Space Agency, they collaborate with NASA in the Chandrayaan mission, which discovered water on the moon. And atomic energy. You know, if you look at the Human Development Index, if India has to become a developed country, its per capita electricity consumption has to go up by something like six to eight times. Per capita electricity consumption has to go up by six to eight times. And there's not enough fossil fuel in the world for this, whether it's India or China. That's why it's very important to go for nuclear. And Yuki Amano, Director General of IAEA, was in Bombay in March this year. And he has said India is the forefront of technological development in the nuclear sector. Not only generally the nuclear sector, but in the area of fast reactors and what we call the closed nuclear fuel cycle. Recycle plutonium and then finally go, going over to the thorium uranium 233 uh, cycle. And when you talk about uh, global R&D, it works both ways. We want to collaborate with the developed countries. But here, he compliments India, willingness to serve as a mentor for other Asian countries that have really joined the International Atomic Energy Agency. Nanoelectronics, we had a brainstorming session seven or eight years back in our office, and we decided that we must have two major nanoelectronic centers. And they have come up very well at uh, Bangalore, I, Institute of Science Bangalore and IIT Bombay. And the nanofab facilities there are comparable to the best in the world. And we have a large number. You look at the number of users. These are it's a national facilities, a joint national facility, which is available to all users. Large number of collaborations. And the very good thing is, there is an increasing and very fast gaining momentum of Indian industry going and using these facilities to develop their own electronic, uh, electronic products. The National Knowledge Network, which is uh, the Prime Minister wanted uh, 1,500 knowledge institutions in the country, all universities, all national labs, to be connected in one high-speed, multi-gigabit per second network. 11th, about uh, 1,050 are already connected. And uh, this is a low latency network. We started in 2009 for classrooms, even though we talk of Indian bureaucracy. This project started before we got the cabinet approval. In the sense, we started in 2009 because the National Informatics Center, which is the implementing agency, said we can provide the initial um, electronic components. And the three major PSUs, BSNL, Railtel, and PowerGrid, said that for one year, we'll provide the service free. So 2010, the cabinet approved it. But by that time, one year, we had already connected IITs, the new IITs, to the old IITs, which are supposed to mentor is now being widely used. I talked about the Large Hadron Collider, TIFR. The data from the CERN in Geneva, Center for European Nuclear Research in Geneva, came through the European Union grid through the NKN to TIFR. And this is live data which comes. And, and you have, can create grids for specialized applications, a grid for climate change operated by the Ministry of Earth Sciences. We have a grid for connecting all the brain research people together, cancer grid, and uh, 
You can also do remote experiments. My colleague, who is a protein crystallographer, uses the synchrotron radiation source in Grenoble, sitting in Bombay. He sends his crystals, the data put in the X-ray beam line and the synchrotron source, and the data comes here. And he can select the crystal and then collect, uh, collect the data. We are also expanding this uh, electronic uh, connectivity. We are, as I said, connected to the European Union. We would like to connect probably to the internet too in the United States and also to Canada and also on the eastern side. Today, if you want to collaborate internationally, international collaboration, you must have high-speed e-connectivity. Of course, Dr. Dutt talks about going to photonics, which will come even later. Right now, up to 100 gigs, we can go with this. See, let me come to the end of my slide. We are in the middle of what we call the third industrial revolution. The first revolution was driven by steam engine, printing press, second, electricity, oil, telegraphy, telephony. But the third industrial revolution is being driven by the internet, by the internet, and what is called digital manufacturing, 3D printing technology, which is really additive manufacturing. The advantage of additive manufacturing using the internet is that economy of scale doesn't bother you. You can customize a product. And for example, it's, it was just beginning to happen, and I'm sure Indian industry must get into it uh, very, 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 very quickly. You are making mega prosthesis implants. You can tailor it to the individual instead of having standard sizes. Of course, you can do many other, uh, many other products. Just beginning, they, I, I saw in Oak Ridge National Lab, using plastics, of course, is the easiest to do, but with titanium and all that. It has to be backed by robotics and other advanced technologies, and also by a desire to develop uh, green technologies. So if you want to do this, the Indian India must have what I call coherence, establish coherent synergy among academia, industry, and the government. You must have basic research. You can't create a superstructure of uh, technology and manufacturing without a foundation of basic research. You can't create a superstructure without a foundation. That's why basic research becomes uh, so important. But all this must combine. You must have all these R&D capabilities, but you must have manufacturing skills. And manufacturing is one thing we have slipped behind in the last few decades. We must restore it back. The Indian industry must get back to it. And we must learn to leverage international cooperation. The initiative should be ours, but we should be able to leverage international uh, cooperation for that. And uh, so I will leave it here. There is very, uh, very little doubt that discussions like this are important. Academia and industry have to work together. We must do R&D, but we must back this R&D, basic research, applied research, with also high quality manufacturing skills. And my feeling is that we have these, and we have to only uh, fine tune it a little bit. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention.